Is this working good? Hello, hello. Hello? Just try and use these ones because that one's really like okay. And you're gonna end up giving yourself some neck ache. Um how does this go on? Oh, <laughs> so like that. So that way around. Okay, that way around. Mm -hmm. And then just curve that in a little bit. There we go. No, Hello? We'll just make sure that this is on. So that's the mute button. So it will show you, it will just say big and in black. Mute okay. if the mute button is on. So like that, you see mute. So if that's worth like that, go like that and talk. Hello? 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 Is this working? Aha, thank you. I'm getting positive feedback. Excellent. Good luck. So we're going to go ahead and start the session. I know some people are still wandering in. No problem. So my name is Rebecca Potter. I'm our health domain lead for the DHIS2 implementation team. Um, and I'm here today with a number of colleagues who are going to share multiple decades worth of experience um, on implementation lessons learned for integrated HIS. Um, of course, since 2017, HISP was designated as a WHO collaborating center for innovation and implementation research in health information system strengthening. And so my doctor, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ang Chu, who will be joining us shortly, uh, leads this, this collaboration through the WHO Division of Data Analytics and Delivery for Impact. So some of those DDI colleagues will also be joining us today. So at the core of our collaboration is this shared principle of the integrated health information system. And so what we aim to do is break down data silos, ensure that we're sharing resources, that we're making this kind of data as efficient as possible, as democratized as possible. And we focus on things like, like governance and these other mechanisms that make it possible for these systems. So without further ado, this session uh, will focus on lessons learned through our implementation research and new tools that we have been developing to support the integrated HIS approach. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Nora Stoops, who is an original member of HISP, and she has been supporting integrated HMIS for 28 years. Uh, she comes with a really special view as a, a nurse who then got assigned as a public, uh, a public health monitoring and evaluation officer um, in post-apartheid South Africa. And so with this experience, she has also been supporting countries for many, many, many years to adopt this integrated approach. And so she's gonna be learning lessons sharing lessons learned from this experience over the last 28 years, including most recently some of the work to revamp uh, the HMIS in Somalia. So. Let's see how this goes. The other way around. <laughs> Wasn't looking in a mirror. There you go. Okay. Right testing, testing, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. All right. Let's start. I. Where do I point this? Or is it not? Must I use this? Did you check it before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, here's uh, this Google slides that we're using, so it's not. Okay, can you do? Can I ask you yeah. to do enter? Okay, that that's fine. Cool. All right, so. I know that in these presentations, we are supposed to only give good messages and, you know, challenges, problems get called challenges and get a positive spin. But I think if we don't explore why we've got a problem and how do we know we've got a problem, it becomes very difficult to move on. And these are some of my thoughts on why our RHS, RHISs can fail. And 
you go to many DHIS trainings and it's the DHIS techie team that are there. It's very seldom the program team. So who owns the data? And the program people say, no, it's not my data, it belongs to them. We frequently see, fortunately this pattern is changing, that interpretation and reports are written by the information officers. Vertical programs want special things, and you can totally understand that. So they set up parallel systems because the, the formal system doesn't work for them. The system is inflexible. WHO changes their guidelines on HIV or ART or TB, but we're still stuck in the old system. So we have duplicates. People ask for data without considering the resources, and that's one of our biggest issues. And extensive disaggregation of data by age and gender. What are the things that stop us having a good RHIS? A lot of research methodology is put into looking at routine data and PMTCT is the best example going. How many of us have seen clinic pictures with this, a table dedicated to the registers? Be careful of longitudinal rest registers. They look very nice. They have pitfalls. Ah, collecting clinical data for your diabetic patients, asking how many of the diabetic patients that you saw today have no pedal pulses. That's not management of diabetes, that's clinical data. Donor demands, and this is becoming more and more apparent that the donor demands need to be revised dramatically. Because our routine system works, we end up throwing everything into it because you can get something from a form at the end of the month. No thought given to what are other ways, better ways to collect data. And it may seem weird, but I do know of countries where because of the way the org hierarchy is structured in the DHIS2, um, you don't get all the data coming through for the same level because hospitals have been put on their own little castles. If you go home with nothing else, imprint this slide into your brain cells, burn it in. The HMIS is the cornerstone of the information policy and planning in a country. District management or health management information systems the people and the processes and eventually the software provide the mechanism to monitor this change from policy into action. My best example is vitamin A. We never gave children vitamin A. We now count the vitamin A. When we collect this data on a routine basis, it's an RHIS. And so whatever is decided by health management to implement is, and reporting, so your data collection tools are based on this. The HMIS or RHIS enables districts, facilities, to assess whether or not the goals, indicators, targets, annual performance plan, call it your, are being achieved. That is the aim of an RHIS. Some guiding principles. Use the WHO routine data standards as a basis. Ah, trick question. This one at the top. What WHO facility guide does this one at the top come from? What does that one come from? WHO facility guide for managers. Malaria is a guideline on malaria. What are your routine indicators? RMNCH and immunization. We need to look at those. Do not collect any data twice. If you collect it weekly, do not collect it monthly. 
and it goes the other way around. Never ask for totals. Never put a column called total on a form. Five and five always makes 50, makes 80. So which is the wrong figure? It's not necessarily the 18. It must be based on a minimum data set. Less is more. No data is collected which does not form part of a derived indicator. I will give you two or three count indicators, but that's all. Indicators must have targets. RHIS data lends itself to activity data, doses given, antenatal visits. You may have to include specific program requests. It's a balancing act. And status data is sometimes very difficult to collect. Do you have a power source? Does your telephone work? Those sort of things. Not always easy to collect. What does a successful RHS look like? It only collects data used for indicators and targets. No sex or gender disaggregation unless crucial. And I know that that's a controversial topic. And I know that there are certain things where you do need the gender. Campaign and routine data are reported separately. Campaign data must be reported. Please don't dump it into the routine box. Population data is available to the lowest level in age cohorts. Your RHIS must be updated. I've got so many, seen so many countries now. Now, well, you know, um, we did it about five years ago. Do not ever ask questions about the client intention. Are you going to breastfeed after delivery? You, you, uh. Or what happened yesterday? One of my favorite countries has a question. Did you give your child three meals a day, which consisted of a minimum four essential food components? Consider other types of data that you can collect, record reviews, Sentinel sites. When did we ever see somebody doing a record review or a Sentinel site? Sentinel sites maybe, but yeah. Data quality, just some ideas. If the data is not good, you can't use it. Data improves when there's less. Third bullet point. I've never seen this in any DHIS to implementation plan. Three months after implementing something, you must have a workshop to go through what has been captured. Have they made interpretation type mistakes? You've got to fix it then and there because otherwise those mistakes continue forever. You have to have a yearly data cleanup workshop. And can we collect problematic data in DHIS too? Are there the tools available for us? There's tools to tell us about statistical variations and outliers and missing, and, but are there tools to help us fix the identified wrong data? Our RHIS WHO toolkits must be basic language for all low and middle income countries. I did some work on a, no, with color, did some work in a country in West Africa, and we managed to reduce the data collection tools, the routine monthly data collection tools. It can be done. I helped Somalia with the HMIS revision. We used the WHA data standards. The death causes for neonatal and maternal mortality were too complex and said, Oh. We reduced the age disaggregation wherever possible. We revised the hospital form. Yes, hospitals. Do we have anything going on about helping improve hospital management information systems? I don't see anybody ever talking about it. That worries me. Hospitals spend the most money. Um, separate HR. And I want to end off with this slide. I'm not going to read it to you. It stands by itself. And 
we need to make sure that we are using all our resources in the best possible manner and that we're doing the right things. That's all from me. Thank you so much, Nora, for, for sharing your uh, decades of wisdom with us here. Will someone else? I'll switch it over, yeah. So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Louis, Louis Tina Day of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical, Me uh, Tropical Medicine to present the preliminary results of the impulse study on newborn indicators. I can pull that up for you while you get your mic. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you very much, Nora. And thank you very much um, for this opportunity to present at the um, DHS2 annual conference. Um, I'm gonna be presenting on behalf of my um, colleagues on the impulse study. And the title of our talk is Newborn and Stillbirth Data Quality and Use. Um, some preliminary results from our study in the Central African Republic, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda. And I hope you noted I brought with me um, a, a mannequin of a small baby, just to remind us of about whom we're collecting this data. So here are my colleagues. Um, this is collaborative research from the London School with myself and Marzia as the co-PI. Our implementing partner is Doctors with Africa Quam. So in Italy, Francesca and Giovanni, in Central African Republic, Usman, in um, Ethiopia, Free and Mary. And then our academic partners are Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania, um, calling out Jackie and Donat, and also in Uganda, Makareri School of Public Health, calling out Ronald and Peter. So I'm going to do four things this afternoon. Um, oh, I, sorry, beg your pardon, I forgot to mention, um, we're really grateful to our national advisory groups in those four countries and our international advisory groups and including people from the University of Oslo, Johan, it's um, very nice to have you also in the team. So I'm going to do four things um, in this short talk, talk about why focus on newborn and stillbirth data, talk a little, about, little bit about the new EN mini tools as this session is about new tools, and then share some lessons we're learning from Impulse and then just invite you um, to join the conversation about what intervention should we test in phase two. So firstly, newborn and stillbirth data. A month ago, this report was published and the top line of the key message is this, preventable stillbirths and newborn deaths remain extraordinarily high. Newborn deaths account for more than 50% of under five mortality now, 2.3 million newborn babies die each year in our world, and another 1.9 million are stillbirth. When we look at what priority actions should we take, data improvement and use at the bottom is there. And this is really how it's exciting to be together and think about how can DIHS2 contribute to improving data further for newborns and stillbirths. In the same report, there's a figure that looks at some of the core indicators and what proportion of 105 countries are able to report these indicators in their routine health systems. And you can see it varies from 90% of countries for some indicators right down to 40% for the newborn interventions. Newborn mortality is a sustainable development goal and we've got seven years left. Um, and we really need this data to understand how to um, take priority actions. So in the Every Newborn Action Plan, there was a measurement improvement roadmap and a couple of studies, Ian Birth was a valid indicator measurement validation study. And then Ian Birth 2, um, one of the outputs of this study um, was funded by USAID, was the EN mini tools that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and then finally, the impulse study is um, a two-phase intervention study, which I'll share some of our early phases from phase one. But it's all about using data for action, which is, I know, what's a motivator for everyone in the room uh, in order to end preventable newborn death and stillbirth, but also for babies not only to survive, but also to thrive. So what are the new EN mini tools? These are global goods, freely accessible tools on the Data for Impact website. They were launched in 2022 um, and they were collaborative um, development by this team in Bangladesh, in Tanzania, and at the London School and with Data for Impact. 
And the impulse study contributed to version two of these tools. We get newborn data from different sources, from population-based surveys, from civil registration, but the IMINI tools are about optimizing routine health information system data like DIHS2, so that the data can be used for reviewing performance and policy and action. The IMINI tools try to get that conversation up the data pyramid between the health workers we've just been hearing about in the facility right up to all the data users. And the groups into three groups map, use newborn data, improve newborn data quality, and essentially they guide priority actions to improve availability, quality and use of newborn and stillbirth routine health information system data. And they're in support of all these guidelines that we've just been hearing about. There it is, that guidance for RMNCH managers that Nora just shared with us. So as I've said, the tools are grouped around these three areas. Um, and there are currently seven tools. And um, just starting with a map tool, this helps us look at what data is in the system, where the gaps are, and what's the measurement burden. So it's a macro-enabled Excel. The indicated definitions are uh, uh, already embedded, but there's also flexibility. So um, countries can add indicators that are important to them. Um, you map out all the different layers, so the electronic, like DHS2, but also the summary forms and the tally sheets and the routine registers where the, often the data comes from. And then having mapped, you upload the Excel onto a Shiny app site and get this editable report, um, which I'll show you some results from. Uh, we used, we've been using it in impulse study. The rest of the tools are really built around this virtuous, vicious cycle of data use and data quality. Um, and they function at the health facility level and also at the sub-national and national levels and different tools are relevant for different levels. Um, they're essentially an adaptation of the PRISM series, the PRISM being performance of routine information system designed by measure evaluation about a decade ago, which comprehensively assesses the RHIS. And we've adapted them for the priority core newborn and stillbirth indicators. And we've also tried to make them as automated as we can, just to um, make it as easy as possible for, for national uptake. PRISM uh, conceptual framework is um, to do with improving the health system for health outcomes and the, the, how the, the health information system contributes to that. And they divide up the health information system into inputs, processes, outputs, and then outcomes. And we've been using this conceptual framework um, to um, visualize the EM mini tools and also the impulse study. So let's look at the use tools. There are four of them, and they help us listen to the users of routine data and explore our electronic HIS. And the improved tools, there are two of them, um, and they uh, use routine data quality assessment methods. So um, when I said we try to automate them, we've We've um, updated all the tools using um, ODK survey CTO actually. Um, and so they're all these, they're ready to download off the, off the website and can be captured on mobile phones or tablets. And then those forms can be uploaded into a, another macro enabled Excel, which generates uh, these uh, report ready tables. Uh, but there are more than 200 tables that get generated, but also some figures that are useful in um, writing reports. So just briefly in summary, the EM mini tools are they're designed for national uptake. They're open access um, with digital data collection platform and automated reporting. They emphasize newborn and stillbirth data at sub-national and source health facility level, the registers, the aggregate data and so on. They promote data for action for every newborn to survive and thrive. Um, they're around those three topics, map, use and improve. And they align with the SCORE, the WHO SCORE principles, um, but also, of course, with all the DIHS2 work that you're involved in. So what about the impulse study? What lessons are we learning from the impulse study? I've already introduced you to the team earlier. Um, and we have a website where you can um, follow, follow the progress of this study. The study started by doing a systematic review looking at newborn um, data quality. We identified 19,000 studies, um, among which we could only include 34. And um, 
there was very little about individual case notes data. There was um, most of the work was about routine register aggregate data. What we found is there were uh, many um, different ways of measuring data quality in these 34 studies. And the data quality itself was very heterogeneous with you know, wide ranges in completeness, internal and external consistency. Um, and then there was limited um, evidence available for many of the really important um, data elements such as gestational age. And the, um, the countries where this research was done was very limited and case notes was underrepresented. So Impulse then refined um, our object objectives into the, the two phases, phase one and phase two. And I'm gonna share some results from phase one today. Phase one is being uh, conducted in four countries um, with the colleagues I introduced you to earlier, Central African Republic, Ethiopia, Uganda and Tanzania. If there are people from those countries here, I'd love to meet you and um, continue the conversation. We're in 15 regions in those countries and I'm going to 146 sites between health facilities and data offices. And today our results are around the first 76 sites and about 170 respondents, health workers and data professionals. So um, we're using the EM mini tools for our baseline data collection for phase one. The first objective of Impulse is to map newborn indicator data availability in existing systems. And um, this is the automated report I showed you earlier. Um, when we look at, I'm just going to show you um, examples from our country. So comparing Tanzania and Ethiopia here on that um, mapping report for the electronics, so DIHS2 is the system both countries are using. Um, here are the indicators, um, and then the numerator, denominator, and full indicator, whether it's available or not. You can see in both countries, interestingly, preterm birth isn't there. Um, and then, you know, among the other indicators, there's quite a bit of variability. And the report also has this um, section where we look at, in fact, it really resonates with what Nora's just shared about you know, don't collect more than you need to. So this is looking at among these registers, what proportion of the data elements are used for core indicators as um, described by WHO and what aren't. And you can see um, in Tanzania, for example, there's, there's more data elements collected than are needed for core indicator measurement. And in Ethiopia, it's a little bit more balanced. Our second objective is to assess data quality for these newborn and stillbirth indicators. So we've looked at it in two ways. We've looked at the registers, but also the case notes. But typically at the moment, data is coming out of the registers, but there's interest in measuring quality of care. And that doesn't really lend itself to more and more, more columns being added to registers. So the case notes where health workers write their clinical care is much more um, potentially useful. So here's um, an example of a structured case notes from one of our countries and then a register that we all know. And it's just really important to keep thinking about how those two different data sources relate to one another um, and, and there's, you know, to reduce the duplication of effort. So um, Impulse, as I've said, contributed to version two of the eMini tools. And we've, uh, the tools already existed in English and Swahili. Um, there's now translations in Amharic and French. Um, and we've added on a new tool, tool seven. So there are now eight tools. Um, and that's about the individual case notes. So when we look at the data quality in the registers for newborns and stillbirths, just looking at the denominators, we have to measure total births and also live births. Um, you can see here in this figure that once it starts going up the system from reports into the electronic health information system, I mean, the, the, um, the consistency is fairly good. But if you look at the, right at the bottom, the completeness of the register, and um, this is from the pilot data in Tanzania was only 88%. So, I mean, even before you start pushing it up, you know, you've got a, a data quality gap. We look at the numerators, and this is from the impulse study for 76 sites, looking at eight numerators for newborn and stillbirth. Again, the, the completeness is actually not, not so bad, but the timeliness and the consistency, it really, really drops. So we're seeing really mixed picture of where the gaps are and where to intervene. Interestingly, our respondents, 48% of them indicated that they were aware of data manipulation for various reasons taking place. There have been a number of um, publications about that in recent years, so we decided to ask, and, and so far that was um, what they're telling us. Moving now to the case notes with this new tool, 
and we've um, split the, the variables we're looking for, the clinical information really, into admission history, admission examination and discharge. And among 59 pieces of clinical information that we as doctors need to look after newborn babies, we're finding it's legible, 99%, but completeness is very variable. This is just showing um, Ethiopian Uganda, again, preliminary results, but you can see there's a wide range in data availability. For example, gestational age to measure preterm birth is less than 40% in both those countries. We're also looking for proxies of data use and this internal and external consistency with registers and also looking at how does the design of the case notes affect data quality. Um, looking at some of the other determinants from the PRISM framework um, to, about improving data quality, it was really striking, this is in the Tanzania pilot, that the district was performing much more strongly for um, efforts to improve data quality, maybe identifying a, a gap that we haven't thought so much about the, the source data at the health facility level. Our third objective in impulse phase one is to understand data use by different stakeholders. And this is a colleague, picture of my colleague Usman um, uh, implementing the EMA tools in Central African Republic. So you can't read all these numbers, but I just wanted to show them to you to show that there was really a gap across all the measures that we are capturing for data use. The highest measure in anything we can find is 74% and a, much is a lot lower than that. And um, so there's, I mean, as, Everyone in the room is aware there's a big um, challenge with data use. Um, and again, particularly at facility level, whereas the district, there's some evidence of visualizations and so on. In the facility level, it's really very um, much less. Um, this is some um, looking at a, a score, and the Yemeni Tools has a, a couple of scores in it, and combining 10 components of evidence-based decision-making. We're really seeing clustering, I mean, around 30 to 75% across all levels, uh, whether we're talking about the data offices or the facilities across all the countries. Um, our fourth objective is to analyze those technical, organizational, and behavioral factors to improve uh, data quality and use for newborns. Um, and again, just reminding us of this PRISM framework, we're talking about this section, the inputs of the RHIS. Um, if we think about that promotion of a culture of information, um, and again, just showing uh, examples from Uganda and Tanzania, um, we've already talked about the lack of evidence-based decision-making. That's the lowest um, uh, scoring component in both countries. But essentially, all of it is around that 30 to 70%, again, um, similar in both countries. And then if we look at resource availability, we just, again, heard Nora talk about this a few minutes ago. Um, everyone has a delivery register, which is encouraging. Um, but when we look at the availability in over the last six months off to the right, it's a little bit more uh, varied. But look at this, kangaroo mother care, very, very little paper-based register availability. But yet that's an indicator that's really being um, promoted. But where are we getting the data from? And also death registers are very, very variable in the sites that we've been visiting. And then we looking, we um, have been exploring availability of internet and electricity, both needed to digitize our data. Um, we're finding again, very, very variable. 20 days or more of internet access in a month, um, very varied um, and up to 30% of the equipment um, isn't, isn't working. The other gap we're finding is in um, health worker RHIS education training. Um, there seem to be plans, but then um, as you look at the different actors in the data pyramid, um, not everyone who's being asked to do RHIS tasks is trained to, to do that between data capture and report writing. And then uh, around the topic of RHIS motivation, a behavioral factor, um, again, this is one of the scores that the EMINI tool captures. Um, and we're finding it's clustering about 60 to 80 percent in terms of um, respondents reporting they feel motivated for RHIS tasks. And again, it's very much across all levels and in all countries. So Impulse has got the opportunity to go one step further and to really dig into the data and really explore which components of those scores uh, um, are contributing the most. And, and we're doing that analysis at the moment. Um, another thing that Ian Mini Tools measures is that we call it the confidence competence gap. So people report they're able to do something, but then we actually 
they have a little like a role play a little um scenario and then we measure can they do it and again this is from tanzania some pilot data we found very large gaps between confidence and competence between one and 47 percent gap uh, we've asked all our respondents what do they think about rhis do they think anything needs to change um, and what do they suggest? And we've got literally thousands of um, ideas <laughs> that we're working through at the moment, but um, there are just a few listed here. But we really want to ask the users, um, the health workers, the, the data um, health professionals, what do they want to um, what what do they want to change? So so far, impulse phase one, what are we learning? And um, using the Prism framework as our conceptual model, we're finding gaps across many many of the determinants technical organizational and behavioral which are contributing to newborn and stillbirth data quality and use but of course there are higher performing sites and respondents so we're really digging down to try and identify what those are to see if we can um, you know incorporate that into an intervention to test so as i've shared with you um the aim of the impulse study overall is to improve newborn data quality, stillbirth data quality and use. So phase one, we've been using the EN mini tools as a, as a baseline assessment to look at the current situation among these 146 sites. We're in the middle of data analysis now, both quantitative and qualitative, and asking end user ideas to improve. And we're working towards um, a peer reviewed supplement. And the picture here is my colleagues who are, who are working on that right now. But I just want to leave us today with this question. What intervention should we test for phase two? Obviously, it'll be driven up from what we find in phase one, but I'm just aware that in the room, there are many, many experts who've been thinking about this for years. So I'd love to just invite you into that conversation. We've said in phase two that we want to design an intervention and then test it. And that testing could be um, effectiveness, cost effectiveness. We can test it in different ways. Um, we want to design an intervention that's co-created with our national advisory groups, um, international advisory groups, but also we really welcome the DIHS2 community to this conversation. Some of the questions we've been puzzling about is, how can we show frontline health workers their value in the data they capture that's pushed up the system? I loved it in the role play when the, um, the community health worker this morning said, I've, I've set my, feed, my, my data, I hope I get some feedback as to whether it's useful or not. Now, how can we strengthen that part? Do people here know of educational materials for RHI's competencies for health workers that perhaps we could use and um, use for newborn and stillbirth data? What about visualizations at the health facility level, including for data accuracy? There seems to be a bit of a gap there and just wonder if there are people in the room who can advise us on that. And how can we strengthen that information culture so that that motivation for um, really important uh, data tasks increases? Now, data isn't an end in itself. I'm a clinician, so for me, data is so totally linked to that kind of quality of care piece for the, for the baby that I brought along today. But how can we just get that balance right for health workers providing care and also documenting the care they've provided so that those two things really resonate with one another? So today, I just um, have shared with you a little bit about the importance of newborn and stillbirth data. Please, whatever you do, please um, think about how we can strengthen newborn and stillbirth data. I've talked a little bit about the EN mini tools, which are available for your use um, on the DFI Data for Impact website. I've shared some of the lessons we're learning in Impulse Phase 1 on behalf of my colleagues, um, who I think a lot of them are online, so greetings to you. And just invited you to help us work out what intervention we can test for phase two. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the health professionals and data professionals who participated in our phase one data collection and special thanks to our study team, including all the data collectors and to the Kearsey Foundation who are funding us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise, Tina. I just, I really appreciated this abstract because it is so uh, rigorous and goes into all of these kinds of issues that have also been raised by Nora. Um, 
I know it can sound like doom and gloom, but it is really not. We have many stories tomorrow about what is the impact of, of the use of these types of routine data. So there is a session tomorrow, impact and effective use. But I think a lot of the lessons learned here and what we need to pay attention to is the rationalization of these routine health information systems, and particularly because they are expensive. And I don't mean just expensive in terms of connectivity, I mean expensive in terms of the health workers' time. So approximately 30% of these health workers are spending their time documenting. If they are documenting data that is not being used for decision making, that is time that they are not spent providing better care. So I think these are lessons learned to take in the future. And it is uh, my pleasure to actually invite our next colleague, who also has a clinical background, has now turned into an HIS expert, um, also sitting on the same team as myself. So Stefano Perotti, who is a DHIS2 implementation expert uh, in the health domain. So thank you very much, Rebecca. I hope that you can hear me. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's very inspiring. And uh, what I'm going to talk with you today is about health facility attributes. Well, something that was already mentioned in, in the previous, uh, in the previous pre presentation and uh, why this aspect, wait, they run, they should not run, sorry. Okay, anyway, and how this, this, this aspect, uh, should be really considered to be integrated uh, in a routine health information system uh, for improvement of health key uh, performance indicator. So when I'm talking about health facility uh, attributes, uh, so it's something that uh, it came up several times uh, during our work as well, uh, during different presentation, when we're doing the revision of the different abstracts that we receive uh, uh, this year. This is something that uh, is already present. So this type of information, information that are collected by different platforms, by different, um, in different programs. And now we are going to see why this is very important to be integrated in one uh, routine health information system. So what are these health facility attributes? Health facility attributes really in the practical are semi-permanent data that are collected that are specific for health facilities. So for example, there are key information related to human resources, uh, uh, to availability of, uh, of staff as well, to train staff training, um, availability of the different uh, and provision of different services, uh, availability on logistic. Uh, so it's something that, uh, as I told you, information that uh, is present, information that is well known normally at a health facility level, but uh, sometimes is missing these uh, steps at highest level, district and national level to be able to be, um, to be analyzed. This data are already being collected. They are coming, for example, they can come from the very well-known master facility list. Maybe they can come uh, through other vertical uh, programs. So here is a, an example of what normally is, uh, is being collected. Uh, availability of key equipment and essential medicine. So everything related as well to pharmacy. Um, infrastructure, electricity availability, internet availability as was shown uh, uh, before. The preparedness of our health facility, of our um, health staff about the response to any type of uh, routine and emergency circumstances and uh, uh, availability clearly for specific uh, uh, services. And how are these data collected? So there are already some uh, standard tools that are provided, for example, by WHO, like the Harmonized um, uh, Health Facility Assessment, the HHFA. That, uh, this is a survey that is already ongoing in different countries in which the information that are collected are core and optional. Um, question related to availability, readiness, quality of care management, and finance. This type of information is collected uh, as a survey. So normally is an external person from the health facility that is coming and collected this information. The information are collected, for example, for HHFA are very complete information. So normally when an HHFA is done in a country, it's not done for every health facility, but just some of them are picked to be able then to uh, represent uh, a specific area and a specific type of uh, health facilities. Beside that, there is as well the IRAMS platform. Normally the IRAMS platform is 
used for collecting information specifically at the moment uh, in emergency settings. So and the information that are collected are very specific for, okay, number of facilities that are open, closed, why they're open, why they're closed, uh, service availability for key uh, specific uh, um, services. So during this year, we have been working with, uh, um, in collaboration with Global Founds, with WHO, with Gavi, about uh, uh, on the production of what we call a, um, a global toolkit. So to be able to provide a kind of a starter pack for the different countries to be able to collect this key information. I don't want to go into the details here because finally the information that uh, um, normally are required to be collected uh, we try to standardize with the tools that are already uh, available, like HHFA or ERAMS. But I would like to have more focus uh, on the uh, how these HFA modules and HMIS they are related. Okay, so um, first of all, HFA. So every type of information that is collected related to the attributes of a health facility doesn't replace other standardized tool as HHFA. Also because uh, the type of information collected and the use of the information is very different. Normally, when we say, when we talk about HFA, our information that are collected by the health facility. So we don't have an external person coming inside the health facility to do a survey. Uh, normally these information are semi-permanent information. Okay, so information that should be collected not on a monthly basis. Maybe it can be collected once per year or twice per year, or can be collected ad hoc. If, for example, there is any change for specific emergency uh, situation in that specific area. And uh, the idea and the added value to have this information is the possibility to integrate them in the routine health information system. So in some countries, the information is already collected as kind of HFA, but they are stored in a separate instance. So they are not really analyzed, integrated in the routine health information system. So here is the more, most interesting part for me. So how this information can be helpful at country level. First of all, to plan resources allocation directly inside the country. So you, you are able to see at central level if there is any gaps on the different region, the different health facility, for example, on service provision. Then you are able to identify any bottleneck and accessibility issue. Because maybe, as I said before, there is a specific area in which we are lacking a specific service. And then as well to prepare respond to public health emergency in case we have to mobilize, in, in case we have to um, decide, okay, for a referral system where we are sending patients, where we are going to uh, support specific hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, it's important to have this type of information. Here are some examples. Okay, some visualization that are already present in some of the toolkit that we developed in collaboration with the uh, WHO for availability of services. Okay, I mean, these are very simple information, but they can have a great impact. For example, here we are seeing the availability of specific uh, services at country level. We can see if there is any area that is not covered or if there is a very low a uh, proportion of health facilities that are providing this type uh, of services. Then as well, availability of staff, availability of trained staff. So to be able, okay, if we have to allocate any resource, or for example, as well, country level, if we need to um, orient the different donors, okay, on where we should uh, have an intervention, then we are able to have it through this information. And the most important one for me is the triangulation. So why we are telling to that the integration of this information are core, are very important to have integrated in the routine health information system. Because then you are able to triangulate uh, this, the health facility uh, attributes uh, with the other health key indicators. Okay, so for example, you are able to see, let's maybe take another example here. Um, specific, for example, in this case, we have a visualization on case load, uh, per staff. So to be able to see this indicator normally can be used uh, on quality of care that we are providing because we can have a whole facility that are providing thousands of consultations, but only with uh, three, four health staff dedicating on this. Uh, this will be a basic one, but for example, can be more advanced to try to see, okay, we have uh, 
specific mortality, for example, malaria mortality, do we are providing service for um, for management of severe malaria cases? Or do we have all the equipments in this health facility to be able to take care of these cases? So the ability to have them integrated in a routine information system can enhance this uh, uh, improvement of key health indicators. Here is another example. This is more for uh, an emerging situation. So these images taken from the IRAMS is one of the reports that uh, was just, uh, just published recently. But just to give you an idea, okay, how this information can drive the different donors, okay, to decide that which are the areas in which we should intervene. What is the, the situation for specific disease like tuberculosis or connectivity of these uh, health facilities? So as a summary, we say that, okay, health facility attributes are semi-permanent semi -permanent, uh, information that are collected at health facility level. Are information that are easily collected because normally in a health facility, the different manager, they already know what they have in situ, what they have in place uh, or not. <clears throat> information can be collected through survey. What we suggest, and that's why the added value to having a routine information system is that this information are collected, integrated, in the routine system. <laughs> this information should be analyzed with other health key information from the health facility to, have, uh, to be able to have uh, um, an impact. And the DHS2 as a national uh, health information system platform can make it more cost effective for the health facility to be able to update this information in a regular basis. And that can be available for decision makers. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefano. And so the second part of the presentation, of course, is about new tools. So with the support of Global Fund, we have been working on um, with WHO developing the core metadata to kind of support this, to be able to integrate this into national DHIS2 systems. And what we found during this process is actually everyone is collecting the same data everywhere. HIRAMS is collecting it. The HHFA is collecting it. The Global Fund Pulse Surveys is collecting it. And it is coming all over, but then people don't have it when they need it. So the whole idea of, of these tools, and we'll be developing and publishing a, a toolkit on our website at some point in the next six months. We do have some uh, metadata available. If there are any countries, reach out to us. Um, we are working with some pilot countries such as Uganda and Tanzania and Ghana as well, uh, all with the idea of actually making this uh, data available uh, more accessible in the system. Uh, uh, so we can stop wasting money running out and collecting it over and over again. So our next uh, presenters, we have um, colleagues from the WHO Division of Data Analytics and Delivery for Impact. Um, so Dr. Doris Ma, who uh, I, I'm going to call her the godmother of mortality statistics. In fact, she's going to introduce a new tool that has been named after her, uh, as well as Ninad Kostansiak who is an expert in classifications and terminology to tell us a little bit more about ICD-11. And then we're going to conclude with our own um, John Lewis uh, from His Vietnam, who's going to share a little bit about how we are actually developing ICD-11 compliant um, applications to support um, the proper coding um, and um, underlying cause of death for better mortality statistics and use. And I found that incredibly interesting, uh, Louise Tina, that that was actually one of the key gaps that you had found in the um, impulse study. Uh, so I think we have our presenters online, uh, Doris and Ninat. Um, the floor is yours to share your screen, please. We shared it now, can you see it? One second. Can you see our screen? Okay. No, I'm going to steal it. Hang on just a moment. Yeah. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon. Everybody, I'm Doris Mafat and um, working WHO as a statistician and, and handling causes of death statistics. So 
I'm here back colleague Nina Konstanchek. I will start the first part of the presentation followed by Nina. So, uh, there's one moment. I'm going to try to add your volume up a bit. Just give me one second, please. Can you try again now? Okay, I go back. <laughs> it's great. Uh, much better. Okay. Thank you. Just go ahead and start again. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm Doris Moffat, a statistician in the Department of Data Analytics, working with Anchu and Nina Konstanchek, who's here with me. So, I give a presentation on uh, the role of the health sector in strengthening the CRBI system. So, a score, uh, the score survey which was carried out in 2020 shows revealing, shows revealing gaps in fact in CRVS, that is counting births, deaths, and causes of death. As you can see, the green, the green bars are only the, the number of countries, the portion of countries that can that, that have full birth and death registration. And when you see the, the longest, uh, the shortest green line is in fact showing in, in Africa. Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, where the gaps are most important. When you look at the right, right hand side on certification and reporting of causes of death, the situation is not is worse even. And this map just shows where the gaps are, mainly in certification and reporting on the causes of death. And as I mentioned earlier, these are mainly in Africa, as you can see all the red, red parts. And, and the, 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 the issue is that Despite many initiatives to improve certification and reporting of causes of death, there are, there are fundamental issues. So having in mind that DHIS2 is implemented in those countries, this is where the idea come up that maybe we could leverage, we could leverage on, on your DHIS2 system to start the reporting of, of causes of death. So why are we interested in CRVS? Because it's a, it's a benefit also for her. If you look at that, there are records on the left-hand side from the health information systems, ambulatory care, the EMR, and these are able to give us the birth and death records in fact. And that is linked to the civil identity systems where you have national ID, uh, local registrar office where they will register the birth and the deaths and get the legal certificates. And this information then are used uh, for other administrative systems and for population register, for example, for the voter roster, for the for, for your passport, vehicle registry, etc. So, why do we say the health sector can contribute? If you look at this map, there are actually missed opportunities. The bar, the yellow bar, is showing the birth registration, which is which remains very low in most countries. But the maternal health and immunization coverage are very high. So, the same babies are taken to the to the health facilities for, for, for the routine health, for the, sorry, for the routine health services, but then they are not registered. And the worst is that death registration lags behind birth registration. This is because birth registration, babies need to be registered at birth because when they reach school, most of the time they ask for a birth certificate for the enrollment. And that sometimes also to, to get access to other uh, care facilities. For death registration, the main issue remains that there are no motivation for people to register their deaths. And also there are not, not enough medical certifiers available in when the deaths occur in the community to certify uh, the, de the deaths. So what are we doing here to improve the CRVS system? Our WHO's contribution is we lead the development of norm and standards in the collection, reporting, and analysis of cause of death statistics. For example, we have the definition of what is a maternal death, a stillbirth, and we, we develop the international classification of diseases according, uh, according the causes of death, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the rules for the selection of underlying cause of death. And we design and operationalize a collaboration between health and the CRVS system for mutual benefit by leveraging on the health sector's routine RMHCH interventions to increase registration of births and deaths. So you are advocating for it that whenever someone bring a baby for this, for these uh, services in, in, the health, in the health facility, the health worker, whether it's there or the community health worker should encourage or and advocate for the family to go and register their, their births. We also develop the, the data collection tools within the R routine health information system in countries for completion of births and death reports. 
and we will have the demo of this uh, data collection tool later after this uh, my presentation. We also developed global products guidance from WHO UNICEF on the role of the health sector in improving birth and death registration. And we developed the ICD-11 suite of tools for coding sexual and dying cause of death and analysis of cause of death statistics, as well as training materials and curriculum to support ICD implementation in countries. So uh, what type of tools we have, been, we have developed so far? In 2007-15, I guess it was, that we developed the Start of Mortality Module, the SMOA, but that was based on ICD-10 at that time. And a few countries have started implementing it. But now with the, with the advent of ICD-11, we are moving towards uh, and the new app, which is more, I would say, the uh, um, which has more functionalities also, and, and it's better uh, tied up to what we expect of ICD-11 implementation in countries that will help them uh, in, in, in doing all this work. We had in the middle something for rapid mortality surveillance system. That was during the COVID-19, when we were asking countries to report only total deaths, not about causes of death, total deaths, how many deaths you are capturing every week. And that small package uh, was developed by Oslo in collaboration with WHO. So I will switch on to the floor to Nina, who will continue the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So regarding ICD-11, it came officially into effect uh, last year. And um, there are a couple of novelties. Uh, one of them is, apart from the uh, you know, updates in the content itself, making it up to date from a clinical perspective, there is, of course, the point that we have now in ICD-11 for the first time uh, integration of terminology in the ICD-11 classification, which means that in addition to the 17,000 statistical categories, we have about 135,000 clinical terms and synonyms integrated. And that makes it, of course, much more clinician friendly because clinician or health worker friendly find the level of detail they are searching for when they make the transition from the clinical diagnosis or cause of death uh, to the correct ICD uh, code. And the second novelty is that in order to manage that uh, complexity, obviously, when ICD-10 was disseminated, it was disseminated as a book. ICD-11 uh, comes with a whole suite of tools uh, which allow for digital electronic search, but also analysis uh, of the data, et cetera. So it is primarily a digital tool um, and it disseminated as a digital tool, but it also operates in, uh, in environments uh, where, for example, internet is not available. And you see here the suite of tools which are characterized for the mortality reporting with ICD-11. Um, and they have been basically integrated in the DHS-2 uh, app for mortality, uh, medical certification, and uh, coding of causes of death. And that is part of a larger suite of tools, which you see here depicted. Um, and we basically categorize them into implementation related tools, as well as tools for training or maintenance. And most importantly, all of these tools which are available for end user consumption have uh, the ability to be easily integrated into any kind of software application through the ICD-11 APIs. And that is something also which is very different to how ICD was integrated in the past. So it's not anymore uploading a flat list of hierarchical categories and then displaying them as a drop down list, but it's really consuming the APIs with uh, the search algorithm in the background, which allows you to search and to assign codes using Google style uh, search functionality and smart search functionality. And that has been basically happening in the integration of the ICD-11 in the DHS-2 app. So where we have the coverage of the data entry to the data analysis, to the data dissemination, and John will demonstrate this. But let me just run you through some of the key features here. We have in the app on the data entry side, um, what eventually will become the ICD-11 and WHO MCCD form specifications for the electronic medical certification of causes of death. 
We have the integration of the ICD-11 coding tool, which is, as I mentioned, a Google-like uh, search where you get uh, from the uh, cause of death as it's written by the clinician or the health worker uh, now to the uh, correct code in the ICD-11. We have the integration of Doris, which is uh, the rule engine for automated selection of underlying cause of death. So what we did in ICD-11 is to digitalize the mortality coding rules. And we have now an algorithm which allows to make this assignment of the underlying cause of death, which in the past was done manually, or sometimes in some countries also using um, um, other software like IRIS, uh, integrated into the realm of the ICD-11. There's also a new feature which will come up that allows even uh, processing not only of coded data in the rule engine, but also processing of pretext uh, so that you have actually these two steps. One is automation of the coding and then uh, subsequently automation of the selection of the underlying cause of death. And then we have data um, analysis through the integration of ANA code 3 and code edit um, so that the ICD-11 coded data can be immediately analyzed and then visualized in the respective uh, ways for which are needed. And all of this is customizable to the respective user needs. So this is what I think you will also see in the demo. And um, I think in terms of next steps, just to highlight here that we obviously one of the key big challenges is to facilitate this process of automation of uh, the input data and the course selection data. So that is something which is still going on and we are working on to refine this. And then of course, all the aspects related to integration with other disease surveillance um, uh, applications and also vis-a-vis -vis mobility data collection. So with that, let us stop here. And I think um, we, with this, we hand over to John for the uh, demo, over. Thanks, Mark. Let me just let me play few seconds. Um, you need to. And to turn that way. Is that fine? Yeah, it sounds like anything. Oops. <laughs> Great. So like what I'm going to try to explain or show is the, um, the um, cause of death app, which we built inside DHRS2. Um, this is um, a generic app, which we want to, we will soon put this one in the DHRS2 app, uh, app store, where you can try to download the app and install in your own DHRS2 instance. So we've been supporting this app from the version 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. So all those versions, you can, if you are using any of the DHS instance in your own country, above 35, you can use it perfectly fine. So um, I'll quickly go through the few of the things. First, let, let me just let you go through the, um, I have already installed this app in the DHS instance. So I'm going to see like what all the different features you have. And then I, at the end, when we have some time, like I can just like show you how you can try to install uh, the app itself in your own DHS too. Let's just see. So like here in this app, like you have data entry module. I'm just like going through that very quickly. And like we just say like how best we are, we can do the registration. 
So now I'm just like doing a registration of the, the cause of death. I just say I've reported, date of reporting is today. Death was, let's just say, on a Saturday. Name, David Potter. And here you can actually just select the age or the things. Let me just select is in um yep, 26 years of age, male. Now does you can just like leave these things blank. None of these things are mandatory, it's okay. And you just save. Once you do that one, this uh, frame A and frame B, what you're seeing, it's exactly the same as you're seeing in your medical cause of death certificate. So or there in the program frame A and frame B, and based on your selection by the gender and as well as age, few of the things will appear in frame B. Okay, so now, like here, this is the free text, like whatever the clinician enters, so you can enter on here. Let's just say very quickly, I have noted down the, the diseases, so let's just say edema, and like here, when you click on it, so that's when like you're actually look, you're looking into the WHO IC recording too. So now, like I'll just say, so the recording is acute. Edema. So like here, like you have, sorry, that's wrong. Let's just say edema. Okay, that's fine. So you can see around here, these are all the different details. These are nothing stored in DHRS too. So now what you're trying to do is like the all the list but it's, it is inside DHS too, but you're talking to the other website of the IUCD embedded coding too. Here you have the list of all the different details. You can see the hierarchy and everything. And then like you can just select, okay, this is looks fine. So I'll just select this as the cause. Okay, just one second. You may, okay. Let me just select any of these things. It's not right, but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I just want to select the, the right one because I want to also show you the how the Doris tool gets calculated. Okay, there we go. And then we select it's in, let's just say, five years. You also have this one is hypertension. Just select here. Hypertension. And then the, the last one, which I just select is okay. This one. Yeah, so I'm not a ICD coder or a clinician. I just this is the, the same example which I use. So now what I have done is just have entered a few of the de details. So on the free text side is what the doctor has entered. And on the, the next side is the what the IC recorder is entering it. He's just selecting and searching all the things. Before we had this underlining cause of death, which people were supposed to see and add by themselves. But now with the Doris tool, you can click on compute. What it does, it will go through the all the, uh, the engine. And these are all the different full report of the the door is too, and then it will select the underlying cause of death for you automatically. And with the app, like you also have frame B, where you can try to enter all the different details. That's okay. I'll just like save. And then in the app itself, you have this a simple uh, medical um, certificate um, of cause of death, which can be printed and hand over to, to the people at the, the clinic level, so that like they can go wrong. And this can be customized based on the other things. So this is the simplest data entry form. So this is already finished. 
Now what we also, what we have is the analysis of the dashboard. So these are all the list of all the dashboards which we have created, which is embedded in the app itself. So you don't have to, to go somewhere else to do the analysis. Because usually like in DHS to what happens, like we enter the data in either the track capture or a capture app, and then you go for the dashboard or data visualizer to all the things. So here, these are all the dashboards or the charts, which is already predefined. People can also go to DHS to, to do the further analysis, but at least for most of the things, you already have it around here. You can, if you don't like, you can just select it. And if you can include more uh, data and all the things, it's, it's here. You can also just say for NCD, non-communicable diseases, uh, frequent cause of death, uh, or by the chapters, or by um, malaria, uh, TB, and AIDS. Combined one, you can also just see on here. So these are all the, the things which, which you get embedded automatically in the app itself. After you install, you have all these things. I will quickly show on the administration tool. So for example, if you want to add some other attributes, because every country, they want to include different things. For example, they want to include the national ID or the addresses or the information about who is collecting the data. Those kind of things can be configured by the system admin itself. You don't require any programmer or anything to customize this, this application. And also including the, um, oh, sorry. And also including the um, uh, medical cause of certificate of death. So if this is simplest one, you can upload your logo on the side and then you can just see what are the different fields you want to include or not to include, whether you want to include in the footer or the, the body, you can do that. And if you, if any of the people have uh, like how to build a standard report. If you already have a predefined format, you can also upload that one. So those are the, the two things which can be to work, work around. And then is the translation. So um, this is also something which is we want to, uh, to work on. So um, anytime that we usually, the translation is the people are entering it, but sometimes you want to edit your own translation for your own local uh, implementation. So here are a list of all the things. You can add many different languages. Let's just say, so, and then like you can enter. So these are all the keys, like what you're seeing in the software. So you can just change, and then you can, based on your user settings, it will automatically will switch into different languages, what you're seeing now. And then other part is on the Unacord export. So let me just select this. This is something which takes time, uh, based on the data, what you have. So. Here is like what all the different data what you have entered. It will convert everything, aggregate, and put it into your Anacard export uh, file, which you can download and use your um, the Anacard analysis too, so that you don't have to do the export again in different places. So all these three things is in, inbuilt in here. So let me just quickly just show you one more things. Okay. So just in the dashboard, when you log in, so when you go for this website, dhs2.world slash whocod, the username password is already mentioned in the login screen. When you log in, you have the functionality installation manual and the app itself. If you want to try, please don't do it in the production instance. Always we just say, do it, install it in the demo, demo instance or the development instance, and then like see how the app works. And if you have any problem, please reach out to us. And then like you have all the manuals and everything. So just to quickly show you how the installation works is, if I can open this one. Oops. Yeah, so here, when you first time install, you don't see anything. You will just like see this screen, which is here. So it will show you like where, what all the different things you can select the IC recording tool, whether you want to use the WHO one, or if you already have installed the IC recording tool in a Docker container, so you can actually point out to which service. And then like, you can just like say, um, you have to select the, all the attributes. Where is going? 
Bolt installation. Yeah, here. So in DHIS2, how it works is like you already have all the patient attributes and the fields in, in, in your DHIS2. We are not making anything duplicate. You can use your first name, last name, gender, um, uh, sex, and, uh, and date of birth. If it's not there, you create it. If it's there, you can use it. Sometimes like the first name is called given name. Last name is called family name. So it's up to you in your own local installation. You can include it. And if you want to have any other additional information like uh, investigator, source name, and other things that you can also add in your frame A and frame B, the additional section. You cannot remove anything which is there, but you can add additional things and also patient attribute what you want to try to collect. And then other part is like after you're doing that, so you need to just say, where are you collecting? Which hospital or health center? So you select all those things. And this part, which most of the DHS to implementation, when you do, you're not setting the roles properly. So we usually, any program will should have three roles. One is admin, that means who can change. The one is capture, that means who can do the data entry. And one is only viewing. So these are all the three groups, which we already have predefined it. And then you can select whichever the user who belongs to admin, who belongs to capture, and who belongs to view. And then it will give you the review, and then the installation is done. So it's a, as simple as that one is. So that's that's why like we want to try to, to deal with um, the entry end solution. Let's just quickly go through. So this was the, the unacquired export, which I was just saying. We imported quite a lot of data so that like we can show the, all the dashboard. So this format, what you see here is exactly the same. And you can download it as a, an Excel, and then you can try to use it. So this is basically what I want you to, to present. It's a quick demo. And then you can always, like when you let me just log out. So with this one, like you already have, you can use the COD demo and then the username password is already there. You can go through it, play around, see how things are. And like the app and everything is there. We'll soon put the app in the app store so that like you can try to install it uh, in your own DHS too. Yep, that's basically it, Rebecca. So thank you so much uh, to the presenters. Um, before we close this session, which we will do just a couple minutes early to give people time to transition, I just wanted to give a, a final reflection to uh, my colleague, Dr. Ang Chu from WHO DDI. Thank you, Rebecca. And just a quick um, sum up uh, on, especially on the last presentation that linked to, actually it's a two presentations, one from Stefano on the health facility attributes and, this, and then the big one is on the mortality reportings. So I'm just coordinating a lot of the work within WHO on several different programs that um, implement the standard on routine health information system, but a lot of it also support the implementation of the HIS. Um, the routine, the health facility attributes assessment, I think that is something that coming up, but also that is something linked a lot of the work on the data used in the country. And I really appreciate the presentation from the London School colleagues. I think the data use will be something that is important to look into. And then that should be what drive the data collection the item and, and the, 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 the design of the data collecting the collection system. For the... Um, Cause of death, like linked with the ICD 11. Um, so, lots of countries have asked so far. That by last week, we have at least 11 countries asked for the implementation of the apps. Um, a lot of different ideas coming up, but I think we need to keep on thinking. It cannot be separate from the training of the of the physicians on the ICD 11. It got to go hand in hand, and that's why. My colleagues, Doris and Nena, one is on the mortality and one is on ICD-11, and they have to work together. Um, also, it's important to understand how the country designed, who is doing the coding, who is doing the, the certification for, for medical cause of death, and how we're going to bring the data together and what would be the final product. So lots of it goes into reporting, but also what would be the benefit for the facility when they look at the cause of death that is happening in the facility or in the catchment area. So I think this is something we can continue to buy time over the breaks or coffees or whenever, and then have a communication. But just um, 
something that you know we will be happy to be in touch and see how we can support the implementation of the course of that in ICD 11 because both of them are quite new. So thank you and thank you for this opportunity to present here. The final thank you to Doris and Ninad, who actually got up quite early this morning. I believe they're in Barbados giving a training. So thank you all so much. Um, with this, couple housekeeping. In this room, we will have uh, DHIS2 for health emergencies next, coming up in just a couple minutes. There is an ongoing session in Auditorium 5 uh, right now um, on DHIS2 and NCDs. So if anyone is interested in that, please feel free to move yourselves over. Um, and then uh, the other session happening in Auditorium 4 is the integration tech session and getting data out of DHIS2. So thank you all for joining us for this session.